we are live now and hi everyone and thank you so much for attending today's dental shadowing session with Dr. Otto and please leave a nice welcome to Dr. Otto in the chat and Dr. Otto you can just start whenever you want to. Perfect thank you guys so much for having me um, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your night um, to come and learn a little bit more about or some day in some situations where you guys are um, to learn a little bit more about dentistry and pediatric dentistry in particular. Um, big shout out to Smile Shadowers for inviting me to come speak with you guys. I feel really honored to be in the lineup of some really great dentists that you guys have had come and speak and, and shadow and share their experiences. So I'm um, excited to be here and have you guys learn a little bit today. So um, throughout the session, if you have any questions, please feel free. Um, to drop any of those questions in the chat box and, and I'll have some time for answering questions at the end. I'm also going to share my contact information with you guys today. So anything that we don't get to, um, please feel free to email me or reach out through Instagram or social media and I'll be happy to answer any questions that way as well. Um, you're going to hear, I apologize, my dog's potentially in the background. I'm going to show you a picture of them in a minute. Um, my husband's, I think, just getting home and so they're hearing them and barking a little bit. So I apologize for that. But again, my name is Dr. Alex Otto. I am a pediatric dentist and the founder and owner of a pediatric dental practice in Buda, Texas called Kids Tooth Team. I grew up in Naples, Florida and went to the University of Florida for undergraduate. I got a degree in human nutrition as my major and then I minored in leadership at University of Florida. I'm really lucky during that time to get in, start getting involved with some pre-dental groups. We weren't nearly as sophisticated and advanced as you guys are um, with all these amazing sessions, but got an introduction to organized dentistry um, and some great groups that were involved at UF through the pre-dental associations there. Knew I wanted to go into dentistry and so, you know, really tried to, to do some shadowing like you guys are doing um, through my time at UF and then, you know, eventually obviously applied to dental school and dental programs. I applied to, I believe, 10 programs total when I was applying to dental school from UF. I think I got around six interviews and then was accepted into two programs. Of those two programs, my favorite was BCU School of Dentistry in Richmond. <laughs> so sorry, you guys, they're he's letting them out now. Um, and so I matriculated into VCU School of Dentistry in 2013 and attended 2013 to 20, or sorry, 20, 2009 through 2013 at VCU School of Dentistry. Absolutely loved my dental school training there. The faculty were incredible and I just had a really great experience um, getting a lot of experience in clinical dentistry and a lot of like just hands-on hand skills training, which is so important when you're you know looking into, into dental school so you get a lot of time in clinic. And I feel like we got a lot of time at VCU. So really, really grateful to have gone there, made some incredible friends and, and had some great experiences there. So absolutely loved my time at VCU. Um, I was very involved in dental student leadership when I was at VCU for dental school and got involved with the American Student Dental Association pretty quickly when I started dental school. I was really honored to be a national um, chair for the Council on Membership for ASDA. And during that time, we actually created the first ever national pre-dental leadership position for pre-dental students. And ASDA still has some really great leadership opportunities for dental students. So I highly encourage you guys to look into that. You can go to asdanet.org backslash pre-dental and they have some really, really great resources for applying to dental school and getting involved in leadership while you're in dental school. So I highly recommend checking that out and joining if you're not already a member. Um, and then I also went on to become the, one of the national vice presidents of the American, dental, or American Student Dental Association during my time in dental school and was really honored to, to be in that leadership role and travel around to dental schools um, and conferences throughout the country and meet a lot of the leaders in dentistry who are still some of my mentors today throughout my, you know, my whole career and process. So love my time at VCU, loved being involved in leadership. Some of those leadership positions did take me away from dental school. And so I didn't have as much time to do externships and, and really maybe figure out what specialty, if any, I was interested in pursuing. So I decided to apply to general practice residencies and sort of applied all over the country, um, ended up picking Denver Health's Medical Center as the program that I wanted to go to. It's a general practice residency in a hospital setting, and uh, they saw a lot of pediatric patients, 
had a feeling I might like pediatrics when I was in dental school, but I just wasn't quite sure. So I thought that going to Denver Health would be a great opportunity to get some experience treating patients. Um, we took pediatric patients to the operating room. So I got that hospital um, kind of experience with pediatrics and was really glad that I attended that program. I got a lot faster in all aspects of dentistry. Um, really, I'm a big proponent of doing a residency, even just a GPR or advanced education in general dentistry, AEGD, after dental school, because you get to work with a dental assistant, you get to work with a dental lab, um, get a lot faster in all aspects of dentistry. So I was really happy that I did that right after dental school. I did confirm that I like treating pedi pediatric patients. I thought it was the favorite part of my day. And I knew I wanted to treat kids um, in practice, but at this point I'd been in school for so long. Um, I was just ready to start working and, you know, paying off some of my loans and, and see how I felt about being a general dentist that sees kids. And so I decided to work for a, um, a corporate office in Denver for about six months. Wasn't quite the right fit for me. So I pretty quickly started looking for some other jobs and found a pediatric office in Denver that was looking for an associate um, and they were looking for a pediatric specialist. I applied to the ad anyway. And I said, you know, I'm not a specialist, but I love seeing kids. I, I got a lot of experience in my general practice residency. If you, you'd be willing to train me and, and sort of mentor me, I think I could be a great fit. And I was really lucky that they took me on. They trained me in pediatric dentistry, how to treatment plan and think like a pediatric dentist. Um, they trained me in oral sedation dentistry. And they also started doing um, a lot of our in-office IV sedation cases alongside a dental anesthesiologist. Um, so we learned a ton at that first job um, in a pediatric setting and probably honestly would have stayed there forever. But my husband got a job in Dallas in 2015. And so we decided to take this job. It was a huge promotion for him. And so we moved down to Texas um, in 2015 and I continued working for a pediatric group practice. This was a really big practice. They had um, at the time seven locations. We were really busy. We saw anywhere between 50 to 60, sometimes 70 kids a day. Um, got a lot of experience and, and just working faster and, and gaining clinical speed and also learned a lot about leadership in this setting because every day I would, I would travel to a different office and work with a totally different team of dental assistants and office managers. And so I had a great experience and actually ended up really liking the, the group practice type of model. Um, after a couple of years working for them, though, I realized that I was ready and wanting to open up my own practice. At this point, I'd only treated children for five years. I knew it was what I wanted to do. And I wanted to open up a practice that focused and specialized in kids. And I wanted to do that in the best way possible. And I knew for me that meant going back to pediatric residency, getting that advanced training and really specializing and being the specialty provider that parents could rely on to know that they were getting the absolute best care for their children. And so again, looked at residencies all over the place, um, ended up picking Alaska, the NYU Langone Health Program in Alaska is my number one choice. I was so honored to, to be accepted into that program and spend the last two years in Alaska um, training under their, their supervision. Uh, we exclusively treated Alaska Native children um, who have that, one of the highest rates of dental cavities in the country. And so we got a lot of great experience with a lot of complex cases, uh, some of which I'll share with you guys today. So very honored and loved living there. Um, giving the opportunity to live in Alaska was just incredible. I highly recommend you guys go visit if you ever have the chance. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my background so that as we go through the lecture today, you guys know who I am and, and where I'm coming from um, and my educational and leadership training and background. A little bit more on that leadership. Like I said, ASDA is such an incredible organization. I highly recommend that you guys join as a pre-dental student and then continue that, um, that membership and potentially leadership as a dental student when you're in dental school. I'm an ADA, American Dental Association success program speaker. So I travel to dental schools and conferences around the country to speak to dental students on topics such as ethics and professionalism in dentistry um, and how to find a job. So once you get into dental school, you guys will continue to learn a lot more about the ADA, um, a very important organization for you to be involved with as a dental student and as a dentist. They're the overarching group for dentists that really advocate and lobby and support the issues that are important to us. So very much recommend getting involved in that as well.
I am a fellow in the American uh, um, in the Academy of General Dentistry. That's the FAGD behind my name. Um, that means that I took 500 hours of continuing education and passed a fellowship exam. I've also sat on their National Membership Council, a really great group to be involved with. They're really passionate about, passionate about continuing education, and they do have some dental student membership options. So once you're in dental school, definitely check them out as well. And then I'm also a fellow in the American College of Dentists, which is the oldest honorary society for dentists. And it's an ethics and professionalism based society. So very honored to be a fellow in the American College of Dentists. And that's the FACD behind my name as well. So a little bit about my leadership um, and all of that, you know, all that leadership, all of that training, everything has brought me to where I am today, which is a pediatric specialist and a private practice owner of a practice called, like I said, Kids Tooth Team Pediatric Dentistry here in Buda. So I'm, I'm very excited to, to be here with you guys today, share my experiences about residency, um, talk a little bit about being a pediatric dentist and a practice owner and I've got an outline in a second for you about what we'll be talking about today. But I just wanted to share a little, one picture of my family. These are my dogs that you hear barking in the background. Um, Rambo is the golden retriever named after John Rambo, the warrior, my husband named him. And then Bremer is our Bernese mountain dog and he's named after our favorite winery in Napa. So those are the guys you hear barking in the background. This is when we first got to Alaska for residency. We actually decided to sell our house, sell all of our belongings. We had a huge estate sale. Um, we bought an RV and um, took two months off and just RV'd across the country going from Texas to Alaska and just had so much fun seeing the country in that way. Um, and the RV culture was really cool and, and fun to be a part of. So this is right when we got to Alaska. Um, and that's my husband, Tim. He's actually the co-founder of our practice. He's not a dentist, but he has an international MBA and degrees in finance and management. And so, you know, without him, it, our practice would not be nearly what it is today. He is the business brains behind the practice. And I feel so lucky to have him helping me do this going through this process now of starting a practice from scratch. Um, it's amazing to me that dentists can do this by themselves because it really is two completely different full-time jobs. Um, the finance and the business and the marketing and the networking really takes up so much time. And I still do a lot of that with him, uh, but very, very grateful that he wanted to do this with me and be on this journey with me. So that's just a little bit about my family. Quickly before we start, um, I have no financial disclosures to report to you guys. This, again, the presentation is just for educational purposes. Everything that I state is a, you know, my opinion is just that. And it doesn't represent any of the organizations that I said that I'm involved with. This is being recorded and streamed live through YouTube. And then um, all the pictures that I'm gonna show you, most of them are pictures of my own personal work and consent has been given by those families to, to use these pictures for educational purposes. Any picture that isn't my work or that I didn't take, I've given photo credit for in the slide. So finally, today's outline. Um, I know a lot of you guys also probably see, you know, do the virtual shadowing through the dental shadowers as well. And I just gave a, gave a presentation with them last week. So I really wanted to make today's uh, presentation different. It's a similar outline, but I put a lot of different pictures in. I have a new video for you guys that I'm excited to share. Um, so I wanted this to be, you know, an extension of that and for you guys to learn a lot more, you know, throughout the session today. So I hope that you, you know, can take away some new points and learn some new things from it. And then I also, after last week's session, went through and, and read all the comments and questions that you guys had. So I tried to pull some of those questions into this session today. Um, the ones that I didn't have a, quite a chance to answer, a lot of which revolved around, you know, just the work-life balance. So just wanted to, to talk a little bit about that today as well. So I wanted to give you guys a quick tour of my office. We actually um, had a, a camera crew, a video, professional videographer come in it like about a month ago and do this huge extensive uh, tour and video promotion of our office. And it just went live yesterday um, on the website and went live on Facebook and Instagram. So I'm really excited to show this to you guys. And I think it's just a really great comprehensive tour of my office. You get to meet my team. Um, it's a little bit long. It's about five minutes, but you know, it goes a lot into my treatment philosophy. And I think it's just a great introductory video to, to my office and, and who I am as well. So I'm going to share that with you guys now. I'm Dr. Alex Otto. I'm the founder of Kids Tooth Team Pediatric Dentistry. 
Um, so Kitsu Theme is a pediatric dental practice. We see children 0 to 18 years old, including those with special health care needs. We wanted to create an environment at Kids Tooth Team where children can receive care in like the safest, cleanest environments possible and know that they were getting care by the best trained doctors, by the best trained assistants um, in the world. And so that's really our, our, our philosophy here is every kid deserves that no matter where they live, no matter their socioeconomic status. We wanted them to have access to that level and quality of care. As far as planning treatment, I really try and have a minimally invasive mindset with children. You don't want to do any unnecessary work. So it's really important that we take a holistic approach to the dentistry um, and really try and figure out what's best for that child and their individual needs. So both of my residencies were based in hospitals. So I did a one-year one year general practice residency and I also did a two-year pediatric focus residency program. And again, not every child needs a sedation procedure. Not every child needs to be asleep for their treatment. But when you do need your child to be asleep for treatment, you should feel comfortable going to someone who's done a ton of those procedures and feels really comfortable with that. So as soon as you walk into Kids Tooth Team, you're greeted here at our reception desk. Uh, the great thing about Kids Tooth Team is that it's completely paperless, um, so everything in the office is digital. You can check in right here on this iPad um, through the computer system, and it's really easy. We'll walk you through it, but it's great because you can totally touchless um, check in. So this is our kids' play area. Kiddos can come in here as soon as you check in. Got a little reading nook, some iPads in the corner, and then we also have this great interactive screen. So up to four kids at once can come in and play games at the same time, or they can turn it into a whiteboard and draw directly onto it. So mom and dad will sit on the bench over here, we'll lean the baby back, and we'll do the toothbrushing and counting their teeth right here in this room, which is great for children under three. This is our financial coordinator's office. So as soon as we're done treatment planning, we have you come over here. We like our parents to be as educated as possible about their insurance and benefits. So we're happy to assist you with that here. This is our open bay hygiene area. So this is where kiddos will come in and get their dental cleanings and dental exams done. I hope you notice that each individual station has their own Bluetooth setup so that they can watch whatever movie they want while they're getting their cleanings done. This is one of our dental treatment rooms. This is also where we do all of our in-office anesthesia procedures and sedation procedures. The biggest difference in a pediatric dentist and a general dentist is that the pediatric dentist gets a lot of extra training in behavior management while they're in residency. It's a two-year additional training beyond dental school, and so we get to create an environment where it's super kid-focused, super kid-friendly. All of our assistants are specially trained in pediatrics as well, and just makes it a lot easier for kiddos to come in, have a great experience, and for it to be successful. Children with special health care needs, we really take our time and go slow. I like showing them, you know, the things that we're going to do before we do it in the most kid-friendly way possible. And I really like talking to parents ahead of time and seeing what it is that makes your kid tick and what makes your kid different so that we can make it the best possible experience for them. So if they have a favorite movie, that'd be great to know so that we can get it on the TV before they even come in the room. We have state-of-the-art technology at Kids Tooth Team. We have a really amazing intraoral cameras that we can take pictures of the child's teeth and the parent can see it in real time on the big screen. So it makes it a lot easier to communicate exactly what's going on. Our panoramic machine is state-of-the-art. It can go all the way down almost to the floor so that a child in a wheelchair can also have the x-rays that they need. Bluetooth headphones at every single station in the office, which kids love. And it's a lot more enjoyable to listen to your favorite movie than have to listen to, you know, the suction, all the hand pieces and all the things are going on. We have a sedation suite in our office that's intentionally made bigger to accommodate all the equipment that an anesthesiologist would need to be able to come into the office and offer in-office IV or general anesthesia to our patients. I also do um, in-office oral sedations and I also do in-office intranasal sedations. So that's one of the things that we do at the exam appointment is assess your child, what they need, and you know which, if, if any, of those sedation options are going to be best for them. And so that's the decision that you and I go through together and, and we figure out the best thing for your kid together, whatever that may be. I want every parent to leave here and just be completely wowed by the experience. I want them to be surprised that the second that they walk in the door, they're asked if we can grab them a coffee or a water. Um, I want the kids to just be amazed at all the fun things that we have for them in the playroom, that everyone here is family. We want them to leave feeling warmed and welcomed and that they're a part of our family here at Kids Team.
What makes Kids Do Theme successful is our incredible team. Every step of the way, you're going to meet someone who is warm and welcoming and will just go out of their way to make sure that you have an incredible visit. My dental assistants are able to get x-rays and help kids talk kids through a treatment in ways that I've never seen with other people that I've worked for. So they're just wonderful. So it's, it's really a team approach. It's not about me as the doctor. It's not about anyone else. It's about the whole team getting together to make your visit as successful and wonderful as possible. And, and, we, and we wouldn't be here without them. They're, they're really amazing. At Kids Truth Team, we are dedicated to elevating the quality and expanding the availability of children's oral health care in our community. We look forward to meeting you and thank you so much for trusting us with your families. that video that take of getting the dogs to sit still and not be barking or moving their head took about 25 times so I was shocked that she was able to get that but again just a little bit about my practice and our treatment philosophy and hope you got you know a good tour of the office and a feel for what kids do team feels like um, now that we've gone through the tour I just wanted to talk a little bit about the pathway to becoming a pediatric dentist so in order to become a dentist, you do four years of undergraduate training, typically. Um, there are some programs or schools where you can do a three-year um, and then combined dental school program, so it can be a little less. But uh, historically, it's a four years of an undergraduate training and then four years of dental, dental school. And then after that, that's where most dentists stop their training. They do their undergrad, they do the dental school, and then a lot of them will go out and start practicing. And, and that's what the majority of my friends at VCU went out into practice and started practicing right after dental school and that's a great option for a lot of people you know though if that's your plan really focus on going to a dental school that has incredible clinical experience because four years is honestly such a short time to get all the experience that you need and a lot of times you're really only in the clinic for two of those years so really focus on the schools that you're looking into if that's your plan to stop right after dental school a lot of general dentists will then, you know, some will do a one-year general practice residency or advanced education in general dentistry. That's an option. Pediatric dentists, however, will do an additional two or three years after dental school in their residency training. Most of the programs are two years, but there are several master's degree programs that are three years. Um, and those are great programs if you're interested in, in being a part of the education system and, and potentially being a teacher or interested in research and, and getting your master's that way. And then beyond that, you also um, have to go through a whole board certification process to become a board certified pediatric dentist. And that's a two part process where you take an extensive written exam. And then after a year after you take the written exam, you're eligible to take the oral examination. And so that's a whole additional process that is beyond pediatric residencies training um, that you take to become board certified, which a lot of pediatric dentists do. So that's typically the process and the, and the pathway of becoming a pediatric dentist. So I wanna talk a little bit about what a typical day might look like for me in the office. So typically the mornings at Kids Tooth Team, I'll get in around seven. I'm typically the first person, my husband and I will be the first people to get there and arrive. We always do a sweep of the office. Every single morning, my husband gets the vacuum out and he's just like vacuuming around, making sure everything's perfect and clean. And I take a good look at the day ahead and you know make sure that we're organized and ready to go. The team will get there around 7.30, put their scrubs on and get ready. And then we all have a big morning huddle together at 7.45, just making sure that there's no issues, that we have all of our lab cases in, that everyone knows you know, what's going on for the day and that we're ready to go. Typically see our first patient of the day around 8 a.m. And I'll usually do you know, one or two oral sedations in the morning. We do those oral sedation procedures, um, which is basically when a child will come in and drink a medicine that helps them to be a little bit more relaxed and comfortable and accepting of treatment. Um, we do those first thing in the morning because children can't eat or drink anything um, for a certain amount of time before that appointment. Typically it's nothing after midnight. So we don't want, want really little kids having to go all day without eating. So we do those first thing in the morning. Um, after that, I'll do some restorative treatment uh, procedures, which I'll talk to you about what those might entail in a little bit. And then also I'm seeing you know, anywhere between 15 and 20 hygiene patients. And those are the patients that are just coming in for their exams and cleanings and checkups. So we'll get their cleaning done, get all their x-rays, and then I'll come over and do their exam and check on them. And so all this is kind of happening simultaneously. And we organize our schedule in a way that I can kind of jump in between these and go back and forth between um, some of these different treatments. We take lunch from one to two. 
during that lunch, I'm finishing up my notes. I'm doing some networking. Um, I, because we're a brand, we're really a brand new office. We just opened in September. I'm still going around and visiting a lot of the offices in the area. So I'm spending my lunch, you know, getting lunch with orthodontist or general dentist in town, and, and trying to really get our name out there and network with other um, providers in the area. So I usually spend my lunch doing that and, and catching up on notes. And then in the afternoon, we also do restorative treatments throughout the afternoon. Uh, most of those involve laughing gas or nitrous oxide just to help kiddos uh, be a little bit more comfortable for the treatment. They usually do really well with the laughing gas. And then we do more hygiene checkups and appointments and a lot of like, you know, sealants and preventative work during that time, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. Our office closes at five and then I hang out for about an, typically an hour after that, just finishing up the notes, again, checking the office, making sure that um, all of our citizens who have checklists of their own, that all those checklists were completed. And then typically we'll have some sort of a networking event throughout the week. I'll tell you some of the groups that I'm involved with that later, but again, local or uh, general dentist, orthodontist specialist, and some of the leadership groups in town. So even though our last patient's over at five, the day typically doesn't end for a little bit longer for us. And then other responsibilities that are, you know, that we have going on throughout the week and throughout the month. Um, we are, as a practice owner, you are on call a lot of times. As a general dentist, I didn't really get a lot of calls. As a pediatric dentist, you're more likely to have after hours calls. Um, just because kids are involved in sports or, you know, things happen not on a parent's time. Luckily in Austin, we have a big call group. So I share a call with about 15 other offices. And so it's nice to be able to kind of share that responsibility and not be on call all the time. So it's nice to be a part of a call group in that way. I, um, I go to the hospital and, and pediatric dentistry. One of the pillars of our specialty is that we have the privilege, privilege and ability to go to the hospital and treat patients in a hospital setting that need to be asleep for their dental work. So I'm credentialed at a, our local children's hospital and a couple of surgery centers in town. And so typically once or twice a month, one, me and one of my dental assistants will go to the hospital and take care of our children who need to be treated in that type of setting. I also have a, an anesthesiologist that we work with, and she's a medical pediatric MD anesthesiologist, so very highly trained and um, proficient. And so she comes into our office again once or twice a month, and the children that we can do in-office IV sedation for, she'll come in and help us do that. Um, those children are asleep similar to how they would be in a hospital setting and it's a really nice service to offer for children who are really young and just have a lot of cavities um, or someone who's really fearful and just can't quite cope or tolerate dental treatment unless they're sleeping and, and have that extra sedation on board um, so those are things that we're working on and planning throughout the week and the day as well and like i mentioned dentists have a lot of networking opportunities just meeting with other individuals in town as pediatric dentists, we work really closely with the pediatricians in town. I get referrals from them. We share patients. And so it's nice to have that relationship with those local providers in your community as well. Kitsu team in my office is really big into community outreach. And so we do everything that we can to support other small local business owners and support our community because we want to have a healthy, happy community, you know, and help out these kids and their families in any way that we can. So we're members of our local chamber of commerce. They have tons of great events for us. There's lots of fun local market in the parks that we attend. So at least one Saturday a month, you'll find us out at like a local farmer's market um, with a booth, just talking to parents and, and you know telling them about our office and practice. We're really big in with the schools and the PTAs. We try and get involved with them um, and help sponsor events so that they can have great events for their families and kiddos. And then we're, we're involved with some local business groups as well. So a lot of our time, you know, that we're not, that I'm not seeing patients, that we're not, um, you know, doing those clinical responsibilities, you have just so much else that's also on your plate, um, especially as a business owner that, um, you know, that I love doing, but it's, it's something that I didn't quite realize how much these other responsibilities might be when I was a pre-dental student or a dental student. Um, and now that I'm here realizing, you know, this is a lot of time and, and effort and energy, but completely worth it um, to be, you know, to be a leader and to be known in your community in these ways and, and give back to them. So we love doing stuff like this. And then, so I just want to talk a little bit, um, again, the lecture that I did last week went more into detail on this, so I wanted to not spend as much time on the procedures so that I could spend a little bit more time sharing some cool new cases with you guys. So I'm going to go through this part of it um, a little quick, more quickly for this session, but these are some of the common procedures and things that we do as pediatric dentists. 
The first one I'm going to talk about is preventative dentistry. And we are really big as pediatric dentists into preventative dentistry. We like seeing kids really young, as early as six months old, um, to get them into the clinic to establish what we call a dental home, where they're coming in to see us and we're talking to their parents about how to care for them and how to care for their teeth. We like seeing them that early so that we can prevent cavities from even happening. And so we have them come in. Typically, if they're under three, we'll see them every three to six months. Um, when they're that age, we do something called a lap exam, which is this example on the left side, um, where mom's just holding the baby and we lean them back in my lap and I just brush the teeth and count them um, and make sure everything's looking good. So this is what we you know, do for this age range. And at this first part, we're seeing them, it's usually a pretty quick exam. Um, and I really try and focus on, you know, maybe just one or two things that I'm telling them, like, you know, we have eight teeth in the mouth now, let's keep these guys really clean. At this age, the most important thing is that we're not taking a bottle of milk to bed with us at night because milk sitting on our teeth all night long can start breaking them down and turning into cavities. And so that'll be the one thing I tell mom maybe at the first visit. And then the second visit they come, they've got a few more teeth in. Now I'll say, oh, look, you know, these two teeth are, they're close and touching each other now. Let's start flossing. And, and this is what a floss picker is and how to use it. And so you send them home with little tidbits. And the, the goal is that if you're preventing these cavities and you're seeing them frequently, frequently and giving them this guidance as they're growing, um, then you're establishing a really healthy um, dental home for them. And they have the resources that, resources that they need for them to be, you know, have awesome oral health throughout their life. And so pediatric dentists are huge about that. We love preventative dentistry. Uh, this is a lot of times what we go and we talk to when we go to schools and do, you know, the fun events where we, you know, bring a, a puppy dog and brush his teeth and go to the schools and share stuff. We, we talk a lot about pedi uh, preventative dentistry in those settings. One way that we love uh, a restorative procedure that we love to do that's also preventative um, is something called a sealant. And it's basically just a resin bonded um, flowable material that gets bonded to the teeth and it can help prevent decay in grown up teeth up to 90%, which is incredible. Um, most insurances will pay for sealants and it's a really easy procedure for kids. Um, we basically isolate the tooth, meaning that we put things in there to keep it really dry. Um, and we put a special etchant in these little grooves and then we paint um, basically the white paint in there. And then we have a special light that we cure it with and it hardens. Um, and it really it just like it turns those grooves that you guys see on the left side, these dark grooves that are, um, you know, even can potentially be the very first part of the cavity forming, um, turns them into these nice sealed off areas that make it a lot easier for kids to clean and a lot less likely to get cavities. So pediatric dentists are huge on sealants and I do every day do we do tons of these. We do restorative procedures, a lot of fillings. Again, just like general dentists, we're going to do a lot of fillings. Uh, we do a lot of white fillings, and I feel like that's probably the material of choice for most pediatric dentists. There's a lot of different choices of white fillings now, uh, but they just look, you know, super natural in the teeth, and it's kind of hard to see, but the, there are two little cavities in both of these teeth, and so we cleaned out those cavities and then put two little white fillings in those teeth, and, you know, they're nice and white and tooth colored so that they match the tooth. And so really great service to be able to offer a cosmetic option for, for patients that have cavities. A lot of pediatric dentists will still do the silver fillings, which we call amalgam. And that's, they're a great material. They're safe to use. They do really well in teeth. I just don't personally like using this material as much. So I don't offer this in my practice, but a lot of pediatric dentists will. And it, again, it's a really great material. There's tons of studies that, that show that it is very safe and effective to use. Um, and a lot of dentists just for preference reasons, just don't offer it as much, but that's still definitely something that pediatric dentists use frequently. We do a lot of crowns in pediatric dentistry and crowns as a pediatric dentist or on pediatric patients are a lot different than crowns in adults. It's a really quick procedure for children. You place them in one visit. They don't have to take a mold and come back and, and place it again in a second visit. We honestly can, most of us can do crowns in like under five minutes. So it's a really quick procedure for children. Almost all dentists will do the silver crowns on the baby teeth. They're not necessarily as cosmetic, but they fit on the baby teeth really well. They're a very strong material to use and they're very, they're easy and, and um, time efficient to place. So it's something that most of us um, as pediatric dentists will place the silver crowns and they're a really great option for teeth that have big cavities or cavities into the nerve. 
Um, some of us, and me in particular, I love placing the white crowns. I think that they look beautiful and they're a really great option um, for pediatric patients and parents who want a more cosmetic option. Obviously in the front teeth, you don't wanna put you know, silver on the front teeth if you can avoid it. Um, so the white crowns for those front teeth that have really big cavities are a really beautiful option. And you can you can barely even tell that, you know, obviously that there are crowns there. So these are four white crowns that I placed on a patient. And then I did obviously I did the silver crowns in the back. Uh, but you can get really, really nice results with those white crowns. And those crowns in particular are made out of zirconia. And so really a lot of advancements in pediatric dentistry in the white crown realm. So lots of great choices there. I will place white crowns on back teeth. Um, not all pediatric dentists do that, mostly just because they haven't had the training or the opportunity to learn how to place those. That was a big thing that I wanted to do when I went back to residency was to get really fast and efficient at placing those white crowns. So I spent a lot of time in residency focusing on that um, and really practicing that skill. The white crowns are different than the silver crowns in that they're a little bit bulkier and the way that you prepare the tooth for the crown is a little bit different. So it just takes practice um, getting used to those, but those, that's a great service to be able to offer your patients. And there's some really great back white crown options. This picture is a picture um, that I show parents for my consent form because I think it's great to show them what a white crown versus a silver crown looks like. And we'll do that a lot. I'll place the white one where it's a little bit closer to the front and you can potentially see it in the line and when they would smile. And then, you know, encourage parents like, you know, on those back teeth that you can't really see, we'll just do the silver crown there. And a lot of parents are on board with that option. We do um, nerve treatments for baby teeth. And again, a nerve treatment isn't necessarily like a root canal like it would be for grown up teeth. We do a lot of procedures called pulpotomies. And that's when we clean out the top part of the nerve and we put a medicine in the area where we clean out the infected part of the nerve and then we put the cap on top. Some of us will do pulpectomies and that's when you clean out the entire nerve and you put a medicine everywhere where the whole nerve was. And then again, the crown on top. Um, these are both borrowed pictures from a journal um, because my practice is new. I don't quite have enough recall patients in to take some pictures of my own work to share with you guys. But these are great examples of that that I thought would um, you know, show you guys what those meant. And so those are just basically two different nerve procedures that we do for baby teeth. And those would be for very large cavities that are touching the nerve. And we do the pulpectomy procedure, this one here on the right, if a, a tooth is infected or if the cavity is just too big to be able to do the pulpotomy, this one on the left, that procedure. Um, and this is again, the one on the right is a procedure that I specifically went back to residency to get more experience in. The Alaska program does a lot of these. This is a great service to be able to offer because this allows you to be able to potentially save a baby tooth that another dentist might have to take out if they don't know or don't offer that type of procedure. So those are the two most common nerve procedures that we typically do in, in pediatric dentistry. And then just like general dentists, we do a lot of extractions. Most of those are pretty simple or routine extractions. The example on the left is just a baby tooth that this cavity was just too big to be able to save. Um, there wasn't enough tooth and gum structure left to, to be able to put a crown on that would fit really well. So we elected to take that tooth out. And then some of us will do more complex or surgical extractions. Again, because I did the one year hospital general practice residency, got a lot of experience in oral surgery. And so I like offering and, and doing these more complex surgeries as well. Sometimes we'll take out extra teeth, which is an example um, of one on the uh, left side here. This is an extra lateral tooth that was growing in uh, behind the forefront teeth. And then here's an example of a mesiodens, which is an extra tooth that grows in between your two grown up front teeth, typically in the roof of the mouth. This one erupted all on its own, so it could be taken out like a normal tooth, but most of the time these don't come out on their own. They stay sort of in the roof of your mouth and you have to surgically remove those. Uh, the population in general, about one to 2% of the population has a mesiodens or this extra type of tooth, but for whatever reason, um, Alaskan native population has a 6% incidence of having this extra tooth. Uh, so we did a lot of these in residency. And so it's a nice service to be able to offer my patients to be able to take those out for them too. And then again, briefly, just wanted to go into the interceptive orthodontics. These are some of the things that we'll do as a pediatric dentist to, to help a child be ready for braces when they're a little bit older. Some pediatric dentists will do full sets of braces and put all the brackets on and do the whole case. 
I don't in particular enjoy orthodontics as much um, as I do some of the other things that I that I like providing to children. So I'm very happy to send my children out to our local orthodontist who I love. And I know that they're going to do a great job and, and, you know, do it the best way possible. So I send most of my full orthodontic cases, all of my full orthodontic cases out to the local orthodontist but I will do this interceptive orthodontics, which is again, a lot of just preserving the space that they have or doing things early so that there's still enough room for their grown-up teeth to come in and come in in the best way. As pediatric dentists, we do a lot of space maintainers. And so basically this picture up here, we, if we have to take out a tooth, we make this little space maintainer. It's a little ring that goes on the tooth behind the tooth that we had to take out. And then these little arms just hold the space of where that tooth was so that when the grown-up tooth is ready to come in, there's still enough room for it to come in. And this type of appliance is called a band and loop. And you can make it right there in the chair as soon as you take the tooth out so the child doesn't have to come in for a whole separate visit, which is really nice. There's other space maintainers that go on multiple teeth um, and fit a little bit differently and that we do as commonly as well. We do habit appliances and the habit would be something like sucking our thumb um, or something called a tongue thrust where you push your tongue into the, the backs of your front teeth. Your tongue is a very strong muscle. So if you constantly are pushing your tongue into your teeth, it moves your teeth over time. And so we'll make habit appliances like this one is called a bluegrass appliance. And so habit appliances like this will help a, a patient substitute that harmful habit of thrusting your tongue or sucking your thumb, helps them substitute that for something that's less harmful. And what that means is that instead of sucking their thumb, we'll encourage them to take their thumb and roll that little white ball um, just as a different way to distract their thumb or, or resist that urge. And then same with their tongue, instead of pushing your tongue, you know, play with that little ball instead of pushing your tongue into your teeth. And so there's some other ways that we can do that as well, but a lot of pediatric dentists will do some sort of habit appliances. We also do extractions for orthodontic purposes to create space for the, you know, the teeth to come in. This is an example of basically these four teeth just don't quite have enough space to all fit in line with each other. So these are four grown-up teeth. These are two baby teeth, the baby canines. And so a lot of times pediatric dentists will just take out these baby canines and you let these four teeth do something called unravel and they just move forward and, and come into line with each other. So a lot of us will be able to identify those needs and help address them um, you know, before a child even goes to see the orthodontist so that they're ready when it is time. Some of us will also do exposure cases. And what that means is if there's a tooth that's not coming in, um, sometimes you'll need to expose it or open up the gum tissue around it to encourage it to come in a little bit faster. This is an exposure I did with a laser in residency where the 12 year old molar just wasn't quite coming in. So the orthodontist asked us to remove the gum tissue around that tooth so that he could put a bracket, orthodontic little bracket right where the tooth was and help direct it into the right spot. So we don't do that as commonly. Most of the time you have to expose the canine teeth on the front. Those are one of the more commonly what we call impacted ones that just aren't coming in. Those are a little bit more complicated. So we typically will refer those to an oral surgeon because it's a little bit more complex of a surgery. And again, I just wanted to touch on minimally invasive dentistry. I know this was something I said in the video that I shared with you guys, but this term and these techniques are becoming really popular in pediatric dentistry. The whole goal of this is to accomplish equal good outcomes with techniques that are less invasive and easier for children. And so that means maybe doing things that we don't have to use the dental drill, um, doing things that we don't have to give a child a shot uh, and that work just as well. And so there's huge advancements of this in our field. And I was just gonna share two of those with you guys tonight. One is called silver diamine fluoride. Um, it's basically a paint that we paint on cavities. It's an FDA approved medicament that was made off label. Or it was made for desensitization. So they would paint it on teeth that were really sensitive. Um, most of the time in areas where the, um, either the root was a little bit exposed or the second layer of the tooth is exposed. They found that this medicine was, would really help it to kind of plug those tubules up and make the patient less sensitive. And then a side result that they also found was that it was actually also stopping cavities from forming. So pediatric dentists will use it off labels to arrest or stop cavities from growing. 
the obvious downside of this is that it does not look very beautiful. And so basically any area where there's a cavity and we paint this medicine on, it does permanently stain the tooth black in the area where the cavity is. We can always go in later and put a crown or put a filling in there when the child is old enough to tolerate that treatment, um, or if we're just having them on a, maybe like a wait list for the hospital. And that was both of these cases that I'm sharing you with you today. Um, both of these children, we painted silver diamine fluoride on because in residency, there was a little bit of a wait to be seen in the hospital setting. And so we just didn't want the cavities growing and progressing. So we painted this on as an interim treatment so that the cavity wouldn't have progressed further to the point where maybe we couldn't save the tooth when they were ready to be in the hospital setting. So these were kids who, as soon as they were asleep, we got those cavities cleaned out and placed beautiful, you know, white crowns in place of those. So this is a great option for, for patients who are just too young to tolerate other treatment or, you know, where parents just don't want the more invasive treatment where we're doing crowns or fillings. And this is an example here of strip crowns. And that's basically just a white filling that wraps around the whole tooth. And then here's another picture of some zirconia crowns that I've done. And another great example of uh, minimally invasive dentistry is using something called Icon. Uh, it's a new material that really helps basically stop or reverse um, cavities from forming if they're in early stages of development. They're really great for what we call orthodontic scars. So this was a patient who had um, brackets on their teeth and they didn't take very good care of them. And so they got these white scars and spots forming all around where their brackets were. And this right here actually turned into an, a cavity that had to be addressed, but the other ones hadn't quite turned into a cavity that needed to have treatment. So we were able to use this icon, which is basically a special etchant that you etch on the whole tooth, meaning you just like put this special material, let it sit into the tooth, it opens up the pores of the tooth, and then you place the, the resin infiltration on the tooth, just air dry it on, and then you light cure it over the tooth. And it's a really simple procedure. You don't have to give the child numb, uh, there's no drilling or shots, and it really helps to minimize and sometimes even reverse this process of these white scars on the teeth. So here's, this is a good example of one I did in residency before and after. And like I said, this little spot, we did have to put a filling in, but everywhere else that you're seeing the change was just from this minimally invasive um, resin infiltration, which is really cool. So like I said, I want to spend a little bit more time in this presentation, giving you guys some new case presentations and going through some cool cases. Again, I'm so impressed that you guys are interested in seeing this and, and learning more about teeth and dentistry in this way. You know, when I was a pre-dental, I don't think I would have had any clue what any of these presentations meant. So again, I'm just really impressed that you guys are interested in and wanting to see these. So this is a kiddo in my office um, who came in saying, you know, his parents said that there's like just a big hole in his tooth and they were actually referred to my office to get a consultation for a possible root canal. So you guys can see this is my intraoral camera, really big cavity in this kiddo's tooth. This is one of the x-rays that we took. And this cavity is just huge. It's almost into the furcation is what we call the in-betweens of where the roots are. It's almost into this furcation and it's like way down to almost where the bone level is of the tooth. So when cavities are that big, it's really hard to save them even with a root canal because a lot of times they'll need a root canal procedure. They'll need something called a crown lengthening where you take away some bone on the side to be able to even have enough tooth to place a crown. So we're talking three different procedures on a tooth that doesn't have a great prognosis in the long run. And so I talked to this family and, you know, I said that this is a really big cavity. I think it's potentially an option to save it with all these different surgeries, but I honestly don't believe that that's the best option. And what I recommended to them is something called molar substitution. And what that means is that we will take out the six-year-old molars, these teeth here, and allow his 12-year-old molars to drift into the space of where those are. And this is a procedure we actually, we did a lot of in residency in Alaska and had some really great results. And I told the parents, you know, he's at the perfect age to do this with a molar substitution type of procedure. It's really important that you do it um, before the roots of the 12 year old molars are formed all the way. So he's at a perfect age to do that. And, you know, basically take out these teeth and allow his other ones to come into the place even though this is the only one that has a really big cavity, the reason we have to take the other tooth on the top out also 
is because if you just take out a bottom grown up tooth and you don't also address the top one, this top one will do something called hyper erupt and it'll start slowly drifting down into this space. And then it'll drift so far down that you'll eventually have to take it out later. And so to be symmetric and to allow both of these to come in in the right way, um, we have to take both of those out through a process called molar substitution. This is also a cool case to share because this child had two baby teeth taken out really early and the dentist who took them out did not do a space maintainer like we talked about earlier where they held the space of where those teeth were supposed to be. And so now he is very crowded to the point you guys can see this tooth is supposed to come into this tiny space. There's actually supposed to be these two teeth are supposed to come into this one space. And the same thing on the other side, these two teeth are supposed to come in here. This grown up canine is supposed to come down here. And so the two grown up molars just drifted so much because they didn't have a space maintainer. He's probably going to have to have two other grown up teeth taken out. Um, and a baby tooth just to make space for his grown up teeth to come in. So a great example of the importance of using space maintainers and, and making sure that that space is preserved for when the grown up teeth come in. And also a cool example of molar substitution, which is the plan that we're moving forward with for this child. A um, couple of pictures from residency that are also good examples of what they look like later. So again, this child had a really big cavity on this tooth. They elected to do molar substitution and take out all four of the molars. Um, there's likely cavities on some of these other teeth as well. So this is an example. They ended up taking those out. And then three or four years later, the 12-year-old molars here just drifted perfectly into that this space. And so these molars are actually his 12-year-old molars instead of his six-year-old molars that are normally there. And then what happens after that is your wisdom teeth start growing and then they come in and fill in the space of where your 12-year-old molars were supposed to be. So it's a really great way to substitute those teeth that aren't doing really well. Um, you know, and the uh, financial implication of that too, you know, it's a lot of money to, to spend on the root canals, the crown lengthening, the crown, and some of those patients who that's not a financially feasible option. This is a really great thing to be able to offer to them that allows them to still have healthy teeth, teeth and lots of molars um, to chew on and use some function. So cool molar substitution case. The second case I want to share is this patient. So he's a 16 year old male. He came in saying, you know, I think mom said, or he said, you know, my side teeth in the front are a little bit smaller than they're supposed to be. Can you fix them? And he's known that they're a little bit smaller for a while. He actually already had orthodontics or braces and the orthodontist purposely left a little bit of left room for us to be able to, to make these teeth a little bit bigger um, and make them more symmetric with each other. I'll show you what they look like in a minute here, but they're basically something called peg laterals and it's a really common condition. Um, the lateral tooth, these side teeth here are one of the most commonly malformed or misshapen teeth for whatever reason. So a lot of the population is either missing that tooth or it's malformed. When it's peg lateral, that means that it comes in and it's a cone shaped tooth. So it sort of looks like an ice cream cone and they're typically a lot smaller. His aren't a very, like they're not a very severe case of peg lateral. Sometimes they're really super duper tiny to the point where it, it literally is just like a little piece of the tooth that you can see, but his are a, a variation of a peg lateral and are a little bit smaller there. Unfortunately, when they left space, it wasn't super symmetric. So there wasn't a lot of space here, but there was a ton of space there. So we ended up restoring or fixing these um, and building them up with strip crowns, which is basically a big white filling that goes around the tooth and really made them more prominent so that they looked you know, more symmetric with his grown up teeth here. And this one on the right, I think turned out great. Unfortunately, there was so much space here that if we made this tooth fill in this whole space, it would have looked too big and awkward. So we ended up leaving a little space there, but you can't really you know, quite tell if you're looking at them straight on that there's a tiny little space there, but he was super happy with the results. We used a special kind of composite that was really cosmetic, which I really love doing these types of procedures. And, you know, I think most people think pediatric dentists, like you're only doing baby teeth and seeing really little kids, but we get the opportunity to see a lot of um, teenagers and get to do some cool cosmetic cases like this, which I really enjoy and like doing. So the third case isn't so much a case about teeth, but um, just, you know, some food for thought of uh, patients with autism or special healthcare needs. 
I could spend, you know, the whole session just talking about this, but I just thought it'd be um, interesting to bring one case and example into it. So this is not a patient of mine, but um, just an example of, you know, a six-year-old patient that has autism. And probably, honestly, once a week, I'll have a parent come in and say this exact phrase to me is, you know, we've avoided bringing him into the dentist for years because they have to hold him down every time we go to the dentist. Isn't there another way that we can do this? And it's so sad to me that, you know, so many children have gone through these hard experiences. And that's something that we focus so much on in pediatric residency is how can we be gentle and treat these children and young adults with special needs and the most um, kind and compassionate way possible. And so we spent a lot of time in residency really focused on special health care needs and how we can help them and address them. And so autism is a, a really common spectrum disorder in our population. The most recent statistic is that one in 59 children have been diagnosed somewhere on the autism spectrum. And it is, it is a huge spectrum of differences. And every single child I've met with autism is completely different um, from each other. So it's not something that you can generalize all of them or say one thing works for them. One person is going to work for everyone who's on the autism spectrum. But there are some, you know, kind of core concepts that we use to identify the children that are on the autism spectrum to help us be able to provide them care in, in the best way possible. Some of the things that are common among children on the autism spectrum disorder is that they have some sort of impaired communication. Most of them are verbal and can speak to you in some capacity. There are um, children with autism that are nonverbal and cannot speak in any capacity. And so a lot of, sometimes they can learn sign language or have other ways that they communicate with their family members. If they're you know, more on the severe side of the autism spectrum, sometimes they won't use any forms of communication. Um, but typically that is one of the, the features of a child with autism on the autism spectrum disorder. Many children with on the autism spectrum disorder have some sort of impaired reciprocal social interaction. And that can be as simple as they don't, when you look at them in the eye, they don't look at you back in the eye. Um, that can just mean that if a, another child is trying to interact with them or play or share toys, that they may not respond to that child in the same way that someone who did not have autism might respond. And so how they interact on a social basis with their family members or with their peers may be different than, than you would expect a child at that age and, and level to be doing. So that's something that we have to take into account when they're in our office, how we're interacting with them. Um, uh, patients with on the autism spectrum disorder typically have restricted repetitive behaviors or interest. And that can be as simple as, you know, I've had kiddos on the autism spectrum disorder who love dinosaurs and all they want to talk about is dinosaurs and everything that they learn about is dinosaurs. And so, you know, something like that would be really good to know if as their dentist, their parents coming in that this is what they love. And, you know, I'll talk about dinosaurs for 45 minutes if I need to, to have them have a happy, you know, awesome visit. Some of the repetitive behaviors can be that, you know, one of the classic ones of autism is that they line up all their toys in a specific order and they like things being a certain way. So these are some of the things that are you know, common among children on the autism spectrum disorder. Again, it's so varied with each individual child that you really have to meet them and talk to their parents to know exactly what's going on with them. Um, those are some of the things that we're thinking through as we're meeting them. And a lot of them do have sensory sensitivities. They can be what we call orally defensive. They don't like you know, people touching around their mouth. This is a very intimate part of your body and your face. And so some of them can be very sensitive to pressure and touch in those areas. And you have to be very mindful about how you approach them and, and touch them and interact with them. And so what I tell parents and the things that we do when we're seeing children um, with special health care needs, with sen sensory issues or sensitivities or patients on the autism spectrum disorder is that let's prepare them as much as we can in the most kid friendly way possible that we can. And so that's why videos like the one that you guys watched earlier are really helpful for children um, with these types of disabilities because it helps them to see the whole office and, and in their mind kind of go through the video and go through the office and, and see where they're gonna come in and see the people that they're going to meet. Um, a lot of these children benefit a lot from having the same exact person greet them and see them and the same dentist see them in the same exact order every single time. You know, and sometimes that's not always possible, but we really try our best to, to do that and to accommodate those needs for those kids who have those types of repetitive um, needs and behaviors.
We go really slow with the introduction process. You know, we take it, I don't run into the office and say hello and go up to them and, you know, shake their hand or, you know, do anything super fast. I'll hang back at the door for a little bit and, you know, I'll just wave at them and say hi and talk for a little bit. And I'll very slowly make my way into the room um, to make it as easy and comfortable for them as possible. Um, and then we, we're really trying to desensitize them to the office and the procedures that we're going to do. And sometimes that means that they're going to come in for a visit and literally the only thing that they do that day is walk in the front door and then they turn around and walk out. And, and that's okay because the next time that they come in, they're going to walk through the door and then they're going to walk over to the play area and sit down for a minute and then they're going to leave. And so it's this very slow process. And I've, I've had children who it did take 10 visits before we got to the point that they were going to sit in the chair and let us let them hold a toothbrush or, you know, something as simple as that. And so it just that desensitizing process is all the senses, their sights, there's the sounds, the touches, everything to them. Um, you need to slowly desensitize them too. And so that's something that we get a lot of training on in pediatric dentistry. And then the repetition process, again, doing the things in the same order in the way that you're that you said you're going to do them is really important to a lot of children um, with ASD. Some really cool things that behavioral health therapists do, and I got to work with one in residency and have a great one in town that I work with as well. They'll create storyboards for these children. And so it's a really visual way for a child to, um, on the storyboard, it'll just be a picture of, you know, the door. We're going to walk in the door, and then the next picture will be the dental chair, and then we're going to sit in the dental chair, and then the next picture is a toothbrush, and now we're going to show you the toothbrush. And so if the child gets distracted or if we you know, get hung up on one of those steps for too long, she'll go back to that storyboard and say, you know, these are the things that we're going to do. Remember, we did this in this order. And so that visual process is a really cool tool um, for patients with ASD to, to use and a really great thing that some behavioral health specialist will help us with. Um, so definitely recommend, you know, getting in touch with some of looking up and see if you have that type of specialist in your community, that could be another really cool person to shadow. Um, we're hosting an event with one, the one that we work with in town in a couple of weeks, just for children with sensory issues um, to come in and have the whole office to themselves and have a behavioral health therapist there with us so that we can guide them through the process of, like I said, just coming through the office and in their own terms and being able to see and have a really calm, relaxing environment when no one else is in the office. So I'm really excited about that event. Um, and we'll post some, hopefully some pictures and you know videos of it that you guys can follow along with in a couple of weeks when we do that. And then the final case I want to share, this came from a question that one of you guys asked on the last session that I did when I was talking about stainless steel crowns and how they had nickel in them. Someone asked in the chat, well, what do you do if a kid needs a crown and they're allergic to nickel because nickel allergy or nickel sensitivity is a really a common condition. And so this is exactly what we would do. So basically this is a three-year-old patient that I saw. She had a nickel allergy and she had 10 teeth that had really big cavities and needed crowns. The first thing I want to say about nickel allergies is that some, a lot of people can be sensitive, but to have a true allergy isn't as common. So typically when parents tell me that they have a nickel allergy, the first thing that I do is say, well, we, let's go see an allergist and make sure that it's a true allergy, um, just so that, that we know what's going on and, and make sure that we're using the safe materials. This patient did go see an allergist and they said, you know, it's a more severe sensitivity and they wouldn't recommend us putting anything with nickel in her mouth. And so at that point, our only options were taking the teeth out, which of course we did not want to do, or providing them with the option for zirconia crowns. And so it was awesome that we had this opportunity and this service to be able to provide for her. So we did 10 zirconia white crowns on her teeth, full mouth of them. And like I said, these white crowns, they take a little bit more practice to, to place and they take a little bit more training. A lot of times it's hard to be able to fit two of them or especially three of them right next to each other. Uh, but luckily in her case, we were able to get all 10 teeth that she needed treatment on, get those nice white crowns on them. Um, and this is right after the surgery. So the gums look a little bit sore just because you have to clean around the gums a lot when we're preparing the tooth for the crown, um, but they healed up really nicely. So just again, you guys asked some great questions about work-life balance in the last session. So just a couple little tidbits of, you know, what I personally do um, to make sure I have as, as healthy of a work-life balance as we possibly can. Again, being a startup business right now, a lot of my life is focused on my work. 
Uh, but that leads me to my first point is that you, you know, you have to love what you're doing. And of course, you know, whatever that mantra is, if you love what you do, you're not going to work a day in your life. And so to be able to love what you're doing and love dentistry. And I can't tell you that as a pre-dental student, I could, I said that I would know that I would love dentistry, but I, I thought that I would love it. And I thought that I would enjoy it. And I'm really glad that I pursued it. And I do, I love being a pediatric dentist. I love being a dentist and, and offering this service and impacting a child's life in the way that I get to do is incredible. So know that you're loving what you're doing and, and do as much research and, and you know shadow as many people as you can so you can make sure that dentistry is what you love and that it's what you want to do. Um, and there's so many cool specialties in dentistry that you know try as much as you can to learn about each of those and really feel like what's gonna fit you and, and be true to yourself of what that is. Don't do whatever, especially just because you feel like that's the hardest one to get into or the most popular. Know yourself and know what you're gonna be good at and enjoy doing. And I feel like that also applies to, you know, practice ownership and being an owner versus being an associate. I have lots of friends who are associate dentists and they work as an employee in an office and they are, they are so happy. They, you know, they show up and they do the dentistry and then they go home and they don't have to worry about the practice ownership component to their life. And, you know, they get to leave all of that at the door. And so I feel like a lot of dentists, you know, they feel like they're told that I have to own a practice and that's the only way to be successful as a dentist. And that's just not true. You know, you can be so happy being an associate dentist, um, but if you want to be a practice owner and you want to do that, then do it and, you know, pursue that dream. You have to be true to yourself and know that you're not just doing it just because someone, you know, said that that's the only way to be successful as a dentist. There's so many ways to be successful and it doesn't all have to end at being a practice owner. So know who you are and your personality and the amount of you know, work that you want impacting your life and make sure that if you are doing that, it's because you love it. And, and again, we love, I love being a practice owner, um, love being an associate too. And it wasn't until seven years after dental school that I really, you know, I was ready to be a practice owner. So, you know, know that that's a decision that you can work through and make as you go through dental school. Really try, this is more to myself, you know, I really try and unplug from my phone, unplug from social media as much as I can. Again, I'm on call most of the time, so I can't, you know, completely unplug, but, um, you know, just try and step away from that and, you know, read a book, get, you know, your head out of the social media game for a little bit. I think that's so important to have that kind of balance. Um, I do a lot of our social media stuff. We also have um, a great team called Wondrous that helps us, but I do a lot of it to myself. And, you know, it's something that, you know, it's very easy for that to consume a huge part of your day. So I really try and unplug and, and not do that when I can, especially on nights to spend time with my family and weekends. And then just it sounds silly, but we really have to make an effort to schedule what's important to us in our, in our work and life balance. Going to the gym is really important to both my husband and I. So we schedule that and we don't break that schedule or promise to ourselves that we're going to go do that stuff like date night or just going out with friends. We have to schedule that and make sure it's on the books so that we have that balance um, because it is kind of both of our personalities that we'd be at work making it perfect and spending all of our time doing that. So we really have to schedule and you know do the things that are important to us. So thank you guys again so much for having me. I hope that, you know, if you did attend my last session that you learned some new things and were interested in the new cases that I brought on board. Um, again, I'm happy to be a resource to you guys in any way that I can. My, I think my, they did an excellent job with our website. We spent a lot of time making it a really great educational resource for our parents and patients. And I think for you guys as well, there's lots of procedures on here that I um, didn't talk about today. So check that out. Um, and I hope that you find some cool pediatric dentistry tidbits there. And I also wanted to direct you to the ASTA District for Pre-Dental Instagram account. I did a day in the life takeover for them. So they have uh, my whole session on there that I answer a bunch of questions and do another cool tour of the office, including our morning huddle. And there's some really cute um, patient interactions on there too. So I would check that out if you're interested and have time. Here is my contact information. Um, hope you'll consider following us at Kids Tooth Team, both on Instagram and Facebook. And like I said, I do a bunch of educational posts for parents. So I hope that you, you know, would feel encouraged to learn something from there and then post as well. And then, you know, all of our cool events that we do, like I was talking about our, um, the day that we're gonna do for patients with special healthcare needs and sensory 
um, disabilities. We're going to post that in a couple of weeks. Uh, we also did a cool ASL training with our same behavioral health specialist. So um, really cool to post that. Some common dentist, dentist phrases in ASL that we'll post next week. And then please feel free to email me at dralex at kissyouthing.com. And I hope that if you guys are ever in Austin, you'll look me up and I'd love to host you, you know, once COVID's a little bit more behind us and have you at least come take a tour of the office and meet with us. Again, big thank you to Smile Shatterers. And if you aren't following them already, please do, because again, they have an awesome lineup of some really great virtual shadowing. So thank you guys. I'm again, a little bit over, I tried to be under an hour, but um, thank you guys so much for having me and I'm happy to stick around for a little bit and answer any questions. Thank you so much for the amazing session. I really enjoyed it. Um, so there is a few questions on the chat more than few actually, but um, so the first question is asking, um, so how do you start your own amazing practice, Kids Tooth Team? Could you please give us an insight? I know that you kind of like answered, but um, yeah. It's a long process. Um, we, and again, my husband was so integral in like getting the actual practice started. After working in a lot of offices, I really kind of got a feel of how I wanted the layout of the office to be and the flow of it to be. Um, and so we just spent a lot of time designing the actual layout of it. We flew to Austin several times from Alaska to look at real estate. Um, we basically built the whole practice from scratch. So when we um, signed the lease of the building, it was just a concrete shell. There was no walls or anything in it. So we found the space that we liked. Um, it was really prominent location right off a of main road in our town. And so we knew it'd have a lot of like traffic and visibility, design the whole office from the ground up, the, everything, all the colors, all the decor, you know, we did together. And then, yeah, just picked an incredible team. So we got our, our team together basically in August and then opened in September and started seeing patients. Um, we saw 100 patients in the first 10 days that we were open, which is incredible. Um, you know, a lot of startups will see maybe eight or 10 patients in their first month. And, and so we were super blessed to have like so many patients that were just incredible and welcoming of us to the community. Um, but yeah, it's a long process. You have to have a lot of help and a lot of people involved. It's a lot simpler to buy someone's office that already exists and they already have everything ready, but I really wanted to do it our way and have it be exactly what I envisioned. Um, and I didn't know what that vision was until I had worked for seven years and, you know, been through dental school. So know that it's okay that you don't maybe have that exact vision right now, but um, I hope that as you go through shadowing and go through dental school, you'll be really mindful of how these offices look and their layout and the types of team members that they have so that if, when you are ready, if that's what you want to do, you have a, a lot better insight. Thank you. And um, there's next question asking if there's like um, consequences to consider when opening a pediatric practice and like what hurdles might one face or have you faced um, in your experience? Yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot of places that are saturated with pediatric dentists, and that means that there's just a lot in the community already. And so I think a big hurdle to face is finding, you know, an area that doesn't already have a lot of pediatric dentists and that there's a need for you to be there. Um, we obviously had some hurdles because we started building in the middle of COVID and this pandemic. So that was an interesting process to like, you know, we had to change our timeline a little bit because we, we thought we were going to open in August and got delayed a little bit with COVID and permitting. Uh, we use it as an opportunity to build, you know, higher grade HEPA filters into our office and have the design be a little bit different and, you know, make sure that there was a really great patient flow that made everyone safe and comfortable during those times. Um, so there's always going to be, whether it's COVID or, you know, something else going on, there's always going to be hurdles in the process of building a practice. But that's why you, you know, you have this team of people on your side to help you through that um, and make sure that you have multiple checks and balances of, of getting the office where it needs to be. And there's also a question in the chat asking, what prompts your decision to choose VCU School of Dentistry? Yeah, like I was saying, I, I applied to, I think, 10 dental schools, I had interviews at six and then was accepted into two. 
And I picked VCU because just the second I walked into my interview, they were smiling and welcoming and I just felt really comfortable there. And I felt like the faculty um, were just really gonna look out for us and, and make sure that we got through dental school, that we you know, had the tool, would have the tools that we needed to be successful dentists. Um, so to me, it was just a gut feeling of I belong here and this is, you know, this is a school that I know is going to look out for me. Um, and it was, and I, I just, yeah, can't say enough great things. I love our Dean. I love all the faculty, just really, really great program. And also like why are zirconia crowns are more difficult to place? They, so the zirconia crowns are basically made of the special metal zirconia. They are not, you cannot bend them. They're like one shape and size. And so you have to make the crown fit on the tooth in a different way than the silver crown. The silver crowns I can bend and I can shape and I can crimp them and I can squish them. So a tooth that maybe is a different shape or is really small, or if there's a big cavity and it's you have space loss because the other tooth is kind of growing into it. Um, sometimes you, you just can't fit a white crown on those teeth because you, you can't manipulate the crown at all. So they're also a little bit bulkier. The silver crowns are just really super duper thin. So you can place those pretty easily without having to take a ton of tooth away. Whereas the white crowns are just a tiny bit bulkier. And so you just have to remove more tooth to make them fit. So it's all about adaptability, but, um, you know, with practice, I can do them in about the same time as I can do silver crowns now, but sometimes they still just take a little bit longer. And that's pretty common for most dentists. Thank you. That's really interesting now. <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, so like you mentioned that you opened your practice during the pandemic. So um, I can't really help asking you this question. So like how did COVID affected your practice and like school and your life as a general? Yep. It, so it was actually, you know, to be opening. So we opened, we signed the lease on the practice in February. We started construction in July and that it delayed the construction process a little bit because some of the permits just took longer to get. And then we opened in September. And by the time we opened, it was actually a good time to open in Texas because Offices were opening back up, the state was starting to open back up and, you know, just allow more routine commerce. And so because you're newer, you expect to be a little bit slower anyway. You're not going to have, you know, as many patients in the door as you would if you were an existing practice right from the get go. So it's actually really kind of nice because we had a lot of time to spend with those patients because we weren't seeing as many to begin with. Patients felt really comfortable coming to see us because we had a lot of time to spend with them. We didn't have, you know, tons and tons of patients in and out of the office all the time. So we had a lot of time to do the you know, proper sterilization techniques in between all the patients. And it got us in the habit of doing those in that way in the safest way possible. And so for us, it actually was a benefit and it worked really well. And, you know, parents were just, the office was so clean and brand new and we had all the up-to-date, you know, state-of-the-art sterilization equipment. And so for us, that was actually something, you know, parents commented on our Google reviews. They're, you know, extremely COVID safe. Everything is so clean and brand new. And so that actually helped us to get more patients in the door because we were, you know, following those COVID protocols so strictly and safely. Thank you. And um, so we asked this question to all the dentists that comes in for our um, virtual shadowing session. And so if you could go back in time and what would you tell yourself with the knowledge that you gained right now when you're like applying to dental school, like during your undergraduate days, um, is there any um, advice that you would want to tell yourself? That's a good question. I wish I had thought about this a little bit more. Um, what would I tell myself now if I was applying? I guess I was so worried about, I think, doing the things that I thought would look good on the application, um, you know, spending more time on the things that I you know, really loved and was passionate about. Luckily, a lot of those coincided with the application. Um, but, you know, like, I feel like a lot of people will do research just because they feel like that's something that's going to look really good on their application, but they don't really like love or super interested in, in research. And so there's definitely some things that maybe I did that I was like, I know this will look good on the application, but I'm not really as passionate about it. You know, I would say as much as you can avoid doing that, 
you know, don't the, the interviews, all my dental school interviews, they didn't ask me anything about teeth or really anything about dentistry. We spend the whole time just talking about the other things that I was interested in. Like I play the cello and, um, you know, we, I traveled recently to Spain, I think before one of the interviews. And so we talked about traveling and music and, um, other parts of your life. And just knowing that these faculty members, you know, if they're going to invite you to an interview, you already have the grades, you already have the, you know, the scores to be invited and included. Um, but then to be someone that they want to spend time with in dental school and feel like that you're going to be a good fit to be a part of their cohort and team. Um, having those other things that are unique to you and make you different, I feel like only strengthen and, and celebrate your application. So, you know, do the things that have nothing to do with dentistry that you love just because you love them. Um, you know, and don't worry about doing doing the things that you aren't interested in just because you feel like they're going to be great on your application. But you still have to, no, get your grades and, and do all that stuff. But yeah, pursue other passions as well. Thank you. And um, there is a question in a chat. Um, it's totally fine if you feel uncomfortable answering this question. But um, so when you were opening up a practice, um, I just feel like there is a lot of like financial um, aspects involved while opening a practice. So um, um, how would you give someone an advice about like risk on like financial aspects when opening a practice? Yeah, no, I'm happy. And all my, the ADA success lectures I do, we do a lot of like debt and wealth man management. And I just tell them, you know, all my numbers of like how much my house costs and all the things. So I'm, I'm totally happy to share those. Um, it is a financial risk and I didn't, you know, I think in dental school, I thought that, you know, the bank would give you enough money that you can just open up your practice and survive. I had to have two part-time jobs while I was opening up our practice. So basically it was working six days a week, um, three days at other locations and then three days at my office. So that included Saturdays. Um, and I was basically working at these other offices just so that I could, we could have enough money to pay my staff and, you know, pay our bills every month. So I think it's, you have to be completely prepared and, and knowledgeable that like, you know, most, in most situations, if you're doing a startup practice, you're going to have to work somewhere else for a little while, um, to be financially secure enough to go out on your own completely. Not necessarily the same case if you buy an existing practice because you're going to have immediate cash flow. Um, but yeah, starting a practice, you know, on the low end, 500,000 up to, you know, there's practices that are huge and, you know, beautiful. They can be millions of dollars. Um, but I think at minimum, probably around 500 is kind of an average startup price. Um, but yeah, you have to bank might not necessarily give you a loan right away if you have a huge debt to income, you know, ratio that isn't isn't beneficial. So, you know, I came out of dental school, $400,000 in debt. And so if you come out with all that debt and you don't have any income right away, a bank's not necessarily going to give you a loan just because you're a dentist. Um, so that was another big benefit of me working for a while as an associate before I opened up my own practice is that we had some savings in the bank before we went and said, you know, I need all this money from you guys. Um, you know, they had some collateral and, and some money um, basically that we could back up the practice that way too. So yeah, there's a there's huge financial um, risk involved in opening up your own practice. And, and we had an extensive 40 page business plan that we, you know, my husband who again has a, a MBA business degree, you know, thought through all of our profits and losses for, you know, the first entire year plus and, and had plans in place for every single marketing strategy. So I think it's really important to, um, you know, give the advice and, and direction from someone who knows how to create a business plan and, and help you think through how that's going to work. It's because unfortunately you just you don't get that time in, in dental school or that, uh, that knowledge to be, I feel like knowledgeable enough to, to do that on your own. So um, definitely get professionals involved in, in helping through that process and make sure you're financially ready to, um, to take that plunge and, and know that you might have to, to work elsewhere for a while as that's you know, getting started and getting going. Thank you so much. I think that answered the question perfectly. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so that will be our session for today. And thank you so much for the amazing session. And um, I really enjoy the procedures and all the stuff as well. So thank you so much.
You're very welcome. I hope you guys have a great night and look forward to hopefully meeting you all in person soon.